Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I want to give a shout out to my sponsors at Blue Chew. Uh, they are a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can try it for free when you use my code Holly at bluechew.com. Just pay $5 for shipping. All right, so my guest today is a multi-talented musician and performer who is really unlike anyone else in the industry today. She won Best Newcomer at XBiz and took home her first AVN Award for Best Music in January with her hair iconically styled in nothing less but the shape of a giant penis. And it was from that moment that I knew that I need to ask the lovely Queenie Satine to come on my podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Holly. I've I've been a fan of yours for such a long time, and it's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. I love that. I love that for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's let's talk about your story because it's really unique about how you came up as an artist and then eventually got into porn. Mm-hmm. So um, we'll start with how you got into the music scene in New York. Yeah. So I moved to New York when I was seventeen. Um, Where'd you I, grow? Grew up in South Florida. Okay. Um, my parents passed away when I was young. So when I knew that when I was moving out for college, that was like, it's that's it. You're on your own. You're an adult. And I was always like, you know, the young one in my class. So I was 17 when I moved to New York and started art school at Parsons. And basically, like, I just wanted to be in New York. I wanted to be surrounded by, like, all the creativity and all the weirdos that, you know, it attracts and I was just obsessed with like the subculture of New York of like bygone eras of like the factory scene with Warhol and the club kid scene in the 90s. Um, so I just wanted to be a part of New York in whatever way, shape or form it it took. And so I was in art school basically not paying attention at all in school and just like literally busking in subways. I picked up a guitar. I was like, I really want to make music. I want to write songs. I loved singing always. So I met all these kind of freight train hopping, uh, trash rat folkies in the West Village. And that's where I started really writing and performing my own music. Wow. That, go so, ahead. so what, um, like what, inspired you to have this kind of interest like when you were a kid was there like a movie that like really got you into this whole subculture was there somebody that you knew that was really into it like because that's a kind of very specific thing to be into you know what I mean Mm. I feel like I remember there it was like mid 2000s it was maybe when I was in high school when that Edie Sedgwick movie came out and then I became fascinated by her what was the movie? Um, I think it was like starring Sienna Miller. It was like an Edie Sedgwick like like biopic. Okay. Um, but yeah, I I've always been into like I'm not even gonna say alternative music, but like like underground music mm-hmm. of of the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties. So I just knew New York was that place. I grew up going like every year and I was just like, I just need, I need to be here. Mm-hmm. That's what I did. And, and I went through multiple, like so many iterations of what I was doing. I mean, I went from like playing an acoustic guitar in a subway station to like ultimately having a dance music project mm-hmm. and, and being very within the gay nightlife scene of New York. But, but yeah. That's how I did it. It started with a, a simple, a simple acoustic guitar. How, what was that like? And some open mics. Because I've like never talked to anybody who actually, you know, performed like in a subway. I mean, you know, we see that all the time. We pass by. Maybe we throw some. It wasn't lucrative. In. <laughs> well, it wasn't. It wasn't. I figured as much, but I was like teaching myself like okay. how to do stuff and. I was just, I really wanted to be Bob Dylan. I don't know. I, I just, at that very moment in time, at that that year, it was like, I wanted to be Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that also takes a lot of bravery, you know, to like, just go out, just put yourself out there like that. Did you? I feel like I've always had balls. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I've always had like big balls. Mm-hmm. And like, even when I was like a kid, I was always like somehow starting altercations with like my friends' parents for no reason. But I, it's just because I was just being me. Mm-hmm. I, I'm never trying to like, I, 
ultimately I think I am a people pleaser mm-hmm. and not, and I don't think that's a great thing, but like I've always had a confidence and like uh, maybe like a loud personality, mm. a lot of balls. So going into the subway, doing it didn't make me nervous. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then so you went from there and then you had a dance music project, you said? Yeah, so I had some bands. I had a band. I wanted it to sound like 60s girl group music. Mm -hmm. And then I went through like all these kind of eras of music until ultimately I was like, I want to make pop music, but I want to make dance music. And I had all these influences. And basically I, I had just broken up with a boyfriend who I was with for a couple of years and I put it this is back in the days of OK Cupid. I put an OK Cupid up and I was like, I don't want to date anyone. This is like, I was like 20. Mm-hmm. I don't want to date anyone. I don't want to fuck or whatever. All I want is a musical collaborator. And I like listed all my influences of what I was listening to. And from that, I only met up with a couple people. But the one person that stuck with me was someone who I ended up marrying for a decade. Oh, wow. Yeah, Ruby, my ex. And we have a band called Satine together. And that's how that that's how that was all born was from OK Cupid mm-hmm. to us becoming a band. And then like shortly after that, a romantic relationship. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how that relationship developed. So we met in 2013. And from the beginning, it was like we, this was like someone who understood where I was coming from creatively. And we had similar references, but like enough difference where we were educating each other on like lots of music and film. And we basically just couldn't, we were inseparable as friends and collaborators. And then basically like we did the lesbian thing of you hauling Mm-hmm. Like I would say maybe two months after knowing each other, three months she moved in mm-hmm. with me in New York. And um, like a year later we were married. Mm-hmm. But in like, but right before, right before we got married, somehow like when she moved in with me, we were obsessed with RuPaul's Drag Race, which mm-hmm. was like, this was before when it was on logotv.com. It was like, that was like our our inspo for doing drag. We were like, why not do it? Why not do drag? Because back when we met, it was before she transitioned. Mm -hmm. Um, So basically we were like, why don't we do music and drag? Mm -hmm. So that's what we started doing. She would do drag and I would do some hyper femme version of me, Mm -hmm. which I also called drag. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we would just get up and, and dance around and sing our songs. That's, I would sing. She would play guitar. So I will say that, like, I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that, like, a woman could be a drag queen. Like, what defines a drag queen to you? Yeah, a lot of people are confused by that. Yeah. And for me, drag, yeah, yes, it's historically, like, you know, some kind of gender transformation. But for me, it always was about a very dramatic look mm-hmm. and some kind of like turned up to 11 version of femininity, mm-hmm. which like, I feel like no matter where I am in life, I always try to carry that through. Um, but yeah, I think anyone can be a drag queen. I feel like now, especially like maybe when I was doing it, people were like, you're not a drag queen. What do you mean? Yeah. Or they like assume that I was like trans or whatever. And And now people kind of like get it, like that everyone can do drag. It's kind of like an an art form for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I was. It's definitely like an art form. Mm -hmm. So, so you said that um, when you first met Ruby, it was before she transitioned. Mm -hmm. When she decided to transition, was that something that was a surprise to you? Did you know that was coming? Like, how did that conversation go? I mean, we had been so we were already married when it was like we were married for like two or two and a half, three years before she told me that she uh, is a woman. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, at first I I actually was surprised, which like is silly because we were most of the time in drag together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like we have a wig room in our house. You know what I mean? Like what I should have seen this coming. But like, I honestly, at that point I was just 
really starting my like immersion into the queer community and queer nightlife and stuff. And I had only been in it for like a year. So I didn't know that many trans people and all the people that I had met that were my friends. I didn't know much about their experiences. I knew it was not going to be. And I also had never been with a woman. Mm -hmm. So it's like I knew that I was bi. I had not had a lot of experience. And it was like I was scared. But ultimately what I said to her was like, thank you for telling me like, I love you so much. I know that once you can love yourself as much as you possibly can, like maybe our love will just blossom even more. Because mm-hmm. if you can be your somebody, full your self. full authentic self, and you can love yourself in that form, then it'll make, like, I can love you even more. Exactly. I mean, to be fair, it's easier to love somebody who's comfortable with who they are, right? Yeah. So, so then how, um, like, how is, I mean, we don't, we're not getting specifics, but like, how is the transition like overall, like for your relationship? I mean, it was like intense. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that like, we ended up ultimately becoming more like sisters Mm -hmm. and we were, we were together for longer after her transition than we were before. But like so much of our relationship was like tied into like our creative connection Mm -hmm. and like also like me supporting her like getting gender affirming surgeries and Mm -hmm. stuff so like it it was an intense an intense moment but also like really amazing and lovely we went on two u.s tours together and and we had like incredible experiences she's still like my best friend Mm -hmm. so so you guys have been able to maintain like a are you, you guys still producing music together yeah so we since i moved to la to start in adult we haven't actively been working on stuff but we have a backlog a backlog of music that we are going to be putting out so that's our plan is to like keep creating together Mm -hmm. um and we do have something coming out this year hopefully maybe this summer so how did you go from this place of you know like playing music to getting into adult so it's funny because I feel like it's such a common answer, I feel like, at this point. But, like, I never did any form of sex work until I started dancing right before COVID. Mm-hmm. And then at, when COVID hit, all the all of the strip clubs in New York closed down. And me and Ruby were like, only, we couldn't tour. We could. There's nothing yeah. we could do. We, we could sell T-shirts. But there was no way of making money. And so we were just kind of like, let's make an OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. So that was my first foray into making like an adult video was me and Ruby had OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. And it was it ended up being something that wasn't for her. Mm -hmm. I don't think she felt great about like she just didn't feel comfortable in that. And that's completely fine. But it was something that was like, I like this. This turns Mm -hmm. me on Mm -hmm. making these videos. And so like we kind of took our page down and then like maybe five months went by and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to make a solo one. And then that's how it all started. Wow. We broke up and then someone was like, you need an agent. And I was like, why not? Like, why not have a new chapter or try a new thing? Yeah. And so how did that go? Did you end up picking an agent right away or did you do any studio work before then? No. So I got an agent. That was the first thing I did. And I kind of just like was still living in New York, signed a contract and then was like, okay, I guess I'm moving to LA. So like a month later, I moved to LA. Like just kind of like that. You moved to LA before you even did a scene? I had done two scenes. I came and visited Okay. and did a couple scenes, met my agent in person for the first time and then flew back and then moved like a month later. Okay, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. If you moved before you even did a scene, that'd be like, I mean, definitely have confidence in your career. Not that you shouldn't, but yeah. <laughs> usually people come test the waters and they're like, okay, I'm going to make the move. So tell me what your first scene was like, because you'd only done scenes previously with Ruby and it sounds like it had been some time um, since that had happened. So now you're going to be doing like a scene on a set with a director and mm-hmm. like, you know, makeup artist and PA, maybe all those things. Um, and another person that you don't really know. So what was that experience like? My first scene was not that glamorous. 
it was like uh, they paid me an extra couple hundred bucks to use my hotel room that I was staying in. <laughs> and I did my own makeup, which I actually prefer. Mm-hmm. And it was just kind of like a POV, like you're new in this. This is your first scene ever kind mm-hmm. of thing. And uh, then it was just over like that. And I was like, okay, I hope I did a good job. I didn't mm-hmm. know. I honestly, was, like even before coming in, I'm not like – uh, someone who knows a lot about th- or who knew a lot about this industry like I couldn't tell you the names of like five performers mm-hmm. <laughs> and like maybe the three I knew was like Jenna Jameson was one of them you know what I mean like yeah. I, like I really went in blind and I was like I don't even know how to be good at this but I want to be good at this because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm competitive with myself and I was like I hope I did good and then the second scene I did which was like while I was here for that short trip it was there was a makeup artist. It was a little bit, it, there was actually, in, it was in a studio. And, <laughs> you weren't shooting in your own hotel room. <laughs> no. And Leah Alexis uh, actually gave me some really great tips on like how to how to have sex on camera. So it was for browsers or twisties? Or, mofos. It was for mofos, mm-hmm. okay. So that's, I mean, that, that's great to have that experience with, well, now Alo, mm-hmm. um, but previously Mind Geek. Um, so... The fir- I'm just curious, the first one, I just wanted to ask a couple more questions. I mean, were you, I mean, you said you went in blind, but like when you went to go do your first scene, were you expecting that kind of scene? Like someone's like, oh, we're going to use your hotel room and we're just going to come over with a camera and that's it. Like, did it feel a little bit, you're like, this is not what I thought I was signing up for. It felt a little anticlimactic. Yeah. And like, I guess it was just kind of like, just do it. You booked it. Like I'm, I feel like I'm that person that it's like, if you book, if you booked me, it's going to happen. I'm yeah. not, I'm not a, like a pull outer, even yeah, if yeah. I <laughs> probably should sometimes yeah. like, uh, it ended up being fine. Yeah. But yeah, I, when they were, when they asked me to use my hotel room, I was like, really? <laughs> okay. I guess extra money. Yeah. <laughs> do you trust your agent though? Um, yeah, kind of. Kind of. Okay. My agent is now defunct. Ah, oh, it's that agent. It was a yeah. I have a different agent now, mm-hmm. which I'm very happy with. Her. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. The agency I was with at first is now defunct, and I yeah. left like six months into the broke my contract, bought myself out of that contract, which is don't do it, guys. Um, I don't have a contract right now, and mm-hmm. I love Speaker. Yeah. He's oh, Speaker didn't have you sign a contract. No, I don't have a contract. I wonder if he, I don't know if he does it. I don't know if he makes anybody sign a contract. Come to think of it, I guess I've never asked that question. For those of you who don't know, Mark Spiegler is considered like the best agent in the adult industry. He's like the fairest, the most straight up, and he definitely won't try to fuck you or hide cameras in his house. No, maybe um, he'll make you watch Cool Hand Luke. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely like he loves to watch a classic film. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't. Know. I, I guess I've never. I haven't really spent time with Mark outside of like seeing him at conventions <laughs> and when he would bring like pastries to set if I was shooting one of his girls that exactly. was always that was always the best he's like a wholesome grandpa he you is know what like I mean? a wholesome grandpa yeah it like was like with a little like he's all sassy wholesome grandpa he's, definitely he's sassy, sassy. He's definitely sassy. <laughs> that's for sure that's for sure so yeah this whole oh god this whole like buying yourself out of a contract thing oh god. it's such an interesting conversation because like I'm pretty sure, and I am not a lawyer, um, I feel like I should get a lawyer's steadfast opinion on this, though it would probably vary, but you can't tie anybody into a contract that has to do with sex work. No. I'm pretty sure that that's not legal. Like, they could not take you to court for that. The only reason, like, people were like, you don't have to do that, da 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 The only reason I did it was just fear of burning bridges. Yeah, I know that's true, because... You're right, because especially that agent would have like probably tried to pressure other directors and stuff from not hiring you. Otherwise, they wouldn't like let you book their other girls. Like they use tactics like that. Yeah, for sure. It was like not cool. I got a weird vibe from the beginning. Yeah. Um, And I feel like I really did compared to a lot of people that that had experience with this past agent. Like I kind of had a a good experience compared to most people. But I think it mainly is because I came into this industry at 30 years old. Mm. I shot my first scenes at 30. And then really when I started doing a lot of work, I 
had like just turned 31. So mm-hmm. like I've been a grown person able to see like red flags. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a lot of not cool people will prey upon people who are younger, less yes. experienced. And when they know that you're like, they can sense it on you. It's like yeah. they can smell it on you. Yeah. And when they know that you're like 30, 30 something, like you're confident, you have been through things, like they not gonna try the same shit on you. Yeah, no predators can definitely like smell their prey. Oh yeah. For sure. And if you kind of give off those vibes, they won't. And I scared my, like, I think I scared my last agents. He was like, they were intimidated by me. So <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't try anything other than, you know, making me cough some dumb some, bills yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes in the end, it's just better to like, just pay that money so that you can move on. Because Who knows, it does... maybe I'll get it back one day. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. So stick around. I'll see you in a minute. Hello, my amazing listeners. You know how much I love bringing this podcast to your ears every week. So if you're looking a way to support the show and get some fantastic perks, I've got just the thing, my Patreon page. With plans starting at just $5 a month, you can be part of our exclusive community. Your support not only helps to keep this podcast going, but it also unlocks some really cool bonuses. Imagine getting access to the live streams of my interviews as they happen. You'll be right in the middle of the action, seeing all of the unedited moments. But that's not all. As a Patreon member, you'll also get exclusive bonus content. I'm talking extra mini episodes where our guests answer questions submitted by you. Plus, you'll have access to my fine art photography and behind the scenes videos, giving you a sneak peek into my creative process. And guess what? If you opt for a discounted year long membership, you'll save even more while supporting the show. Longtime subscribers even get free HRU merchandise as a token of my gratitude. So want to join us? Head over to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered and become a part of our growing community. Your support means the world to me. Let's make this podcast even better. All right, everybody, we are back. So, um, Queen, you obviously come from a musician's background and you've written some original music scores for adult films. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I never thought that that was even a possibility, but like, as soon as I started really getting into doing this, like, this is my job, like, I was like, why not? And Vixen came to me, um, Mike Miller, who is, you know, in charge of Vixen, he came to me and he was like, do you want to write a theme song for a showcase that we're doing? I hadn't, meanwhile, I had no idea what the premise was nothing. It was just like, do you want to write the the song for it? I was like, hell yeah. But then I heard nothing. And then months and months roll by. And then he hits me up and he's like, hey, we still want you to do that song. But we're, go- we're going into production in nine days. So like we're shooting your music video in nine days. And there was no song. I don't even know what this movie is. Okay. So I'm like, he's like, is, I know it's like really short window of time for you to like write. <laughs> record, produce a song for this thing. But, you know, here's all the details. And I was like, yep, I can do it. And so like the next day I woke up and like wrote the song on my guitar. And then, yeah, made that song with my friend George, uh, George Lewis, who has a band called Twin Shadow. Um, So that was the first one. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing because their team made me look like Selena Quintanilla, but like in a gay club, which Mm -hmm. is like, you know, very my vibe. Mm -hmm. And I'm super happy with that song. And then another one was uh, another little like challenge for me, a 1930s realism (laughs) moment. Like it was a period piece that Seth Gamble was directing. And so I wrote like a 30s song, which was like a medley of a couple different songs. And then the third one, it hasn't come out yet, but I'm super excited about it. It's oh, yeah? It's like a country song for uh, a Dorsal feature. Well, you're really like running the gamut on this. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like all the different genres. All the genres. The 30s, the country. That's crazy. And you won an AVN award for one with of those, right? Bardot, um Influence song. The first one that you ever did. Mm-hmm. 
Was that like really exciting? It was exciting. I wanted, I keep calling it a porn Grammy. Everyone's <laughs> like, it's an Oscar. I'm like, it's a Grammy, it's music. <laughs> Even though I know they have an Oscar for music. But yeah, that it, it's really cool to be able to do what I love the most mm -hmm. in like this new arena. And I've, I never ever thought about winning an award like in these big pop culture realms like a, a Grammy or an Oscar. Like to me, I was always an underground club kid, like New York underbelly rat, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And to win any kind of award was not something that I've like, it wasn't a goal. It wasn't anything I fathomed. I just wanted my, I just wanted my life to be really interesting. I wanted my life to be like a story I would want to read. Mm. And to have awards on my shelf now is just like, wow, that's cool. I'm into it now. Yeah. I want some more of those. It's kind of also like an <laughs> underground award though, right? Because it's like, exactly. it's a porn so award, still, which is an still, underground industry kind of. So yeah, we're still here. Yeah. yeah. We're still in the underbelly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of awards, um, you went to ABN this year and you were easy to spot because you had a very unique hairstyle. Can you tell us about your hair for ABN? Oh yeah. Well, I wanted to do something really over the top and like recall all of the, I've done so many looks in the past. Like I was a club kid working, you know, three gay parties a week um, in New York. And like, it was this renaissance for me of like trying something new every night. And in that process, I made so many friends that are super talented with uh, hair and like almost using it as an art form. So. I brought with me my my best friend, Sean Bennett, who's like a hair artist, and he did all my hair for AVN and the finale was a a giant, a giant dick of hair on my head, wig dick, and, and two balls, and it was coming pearls, and then my whole outfit was like a custom pearl outfit. I just wanted it to be really like, like campy and you know, let's not, not put on airs about where we are. Like, yeah, I'm gonna have a dick on my head because this is a porn awards. <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was it? It was mine. I, I woke up one day and I was just like, I'm gonna wear a dick on my head. I was just like, it's wig dick. <laughs> it's wig dick. And and I Before knew- Before coffee, it was your first thought. Exactly. Sometimes they, the inspirations, they just come to me. <laughs> I love that. They just come to me. Um, but yeah, it was that was good. I felt really bad for for my agent sitting behind me. I was like, just gonna ask who sat behind you. Vanessa Sky and and George and Mark were sitting behind me and I was like, sorry guys. And my my hair was like like taller than 12 inches, I think. It was really tall. It was really tall. I could see you like <laughs> at the red carpet where like, which was a fucking shit show, like a huge mass of people. They're like, oh, there's Queenie. I just got to look for the dick. <laughs> it's like you were the easiest one to spot. I was easy to spot. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to top myself ever. If I, maybe I will. Who knows? Yeah. What are you going to do next year? It's going to be so anticlimactic. I have to, I know I have to wake up and have a vision. Maybe I have to have, have a vision. Dicks. Maybe. Hmm. Maybe I'm the dick. <gasps> Are we with a, I love us workshopping my next AVM look together. <laughs> Maybe it's a vagina. Maybe it it's could a be a vagina. And I thought about that. Yeah. Those are that's harder though, because like a dick is a very definitive shape, right? So that's easy to do. But like a vagina's got a lot of like depth to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said your friend's a hair artist, I guess. Oh, uh, he could do anything. Yeah. He did like my first album cover with Satine. He wrote our name completely in hair. Oh, and, wow. like the hair was also probably taller than the, the wig dick. Wow. <laughs> it, yeah, he does incredible hair sculpture. So was, so that, so it was a wig? It was a series of pieces like sewed onto my head. Okay. It was like, so basically the base was like a foam. Okay foam wrapped in hair um but yeah it was really lightweight <laughs> so were you able to like preserve it in any way or did it have to be destroyed <laughs> it's actually in my avn trophy box okay which i felt was like really perfect i was like yeah. it fits oh it did fit only one of the balls fits in there but i still have the the, the hair dick and balls <laughs> So, oh, did you have to separate the balls from the dick? Yeah, the other ball is somewhere else. 
What do you mean somewhere? Like where is somewhere else? I don't know. In like another just, box. <laughs> just like randomly like under your desk. It might be in it might be in the ex-biz box. Oh, okay. Because you have so many award boxes. Oh my that God, only to, two. You just have to split up your, your dick hair between <laughs> yeah, the two exactly. award boxes. I mean, were you like sad? I, I don't know. Like whenever I get my hair and makeup done, because it's not that often, like at the end of the day, I'm kind of sad to take it off because I'm oh, like, yeah. oh, you know, you have to like, you know, take off this masterpiece. I mean, like taking that hair down, were you kind of like, did you like almost want to sleep in it a little bit? Sleep in it? I don't know because it was kind of hurting my head after a certain point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it's always sad when the glam comes off and, you know, it was a great, I just knew, I knew I got a lot of pictures and stuff. So I was like, I did my work. <laughs> and then I, and actually I couldn't get it off by myself because it was like, when I tell you it was like sewn yeah. into my hair, like with actual needle and thread. It was. And, and my friend Emma Magnolia had to come and, and unstitch it from my head. So you did like call and be like, Emma, can you help come get this dick off my head? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it was a little cute bonding moment on my hotel bed. <sighs> Emma Emma seems like the kind of person that would, you know, she'd be there for you, when, a good you friend. when you need a dick removed. From oh, yeah. Head. Dick I, removal. <laughs> we had to surgically remove the dick from my head. Oh, my God. I could talk about your your wig dick forever. <laughs> I'm glad that that was like your entry point to me. You're like, now I need to Google her. Yeah. Wig dick. Wow. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just like it's so hard to stand out in the industry, you know, because it's like every, you know, it's full of a lot of creative, interesting people. And I've been in it for so long. Um, but, you know, there, I feel like everybody's done everything. But like no one's done a, a wig dick. Like I'm pretty fucking sure that you're the first wig dick. That's really surprising ever. To me. In like my 25 years, AVN's been around longer than me. 30 years, 40 years, 35 years. I mean, that's like you will be remembered forever. Thank you. I felt like it was low-hanging fruit. I was like, how has no one done this? I'm just going to do it. I don't think anybody had the balls. <laughs> <laughs> to <do it> like <laughs> you did. <laughs> Did you get any like um, comments about it that were maybe less than savory? Like, was anyone like, "What the fuck? Why are you wearing a dick on your head?" Like, did you get any flack about it? No, I mean, like, people were just like really, really, really lovely and nice about my look. Good. Yeah. Good. Mainly, I, or maybe I'm delusional. Maybe someone said something shady and I wasn't paying attention, mm -hmm. but I was feeling myself. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I feel like if there's anywhere that you can walk around with a, a dick on your head, it's AVN, to be fair. Totally. Yeah. It seems just like the right sentence. It is the right it. place. It is appropriate, like you said. Um, you've also said that you've discovered that you're actually quite a squirter when you started doing porn, which is something that you didn't know before. Um, I did. Mm -hmm. So the first time I ever squirted was like, I was probably like 20, and this guy was just like, he was like one of those guys that really knows how to get it out of girls. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, what's this i was like really floored and then it took me like it took me eight years to figure out how to do it to myself mm. and now yeah i have i have squirted quite a bit and you've done some interesting squirt scenes can you tell us about those yeah so the ones that come to mind are one of them was the plot was it was a trans scene and my, it's my girlfriend. It's like a lovely, loving girlfriend scene. My girlfriend's an artist. She's a painter. And she's like, not sure what this painting needs. It needs something. And I'm like, light bulb moment. It needs me to squirt on it. <laughs> so I, you know, squirt all over this abstract painting. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I really wanted the colors to run, but the acrylic paint was so thick uh -huh. that it really like, you know, it got wet, but it didn't really have that dramatic effect of running paint. Yeah. But it did, I squirted so much on it. Yeah, you really tried. I, I'm, I, I have long distance squirting. Really? Like if this was like a world sex, world records thing, I think I could maybe so contend. You, you know, I feel like we've never, we've never like had a contest. We've never like lined up girls to see who could squirt the furthest. I can squirt really far and, mm -hmm. and a lot. Hmm. Like I have like a strong stream, like and like long distance squirting. Long you're like the Peter North of squirting. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> did he win the? I don't know if like like again. I don't think anybody ever like had a contest, but I think it's like kind of he's well known to be like the long distance long comer. distance comer. Like he he 
he could get very far. Yeah. For sure. It was like what he was known for. So um, you've also said that you've squirted on expensive cars. Yes. And I squirted. I was a vampire mm -hmm. and I squirted on a Maserati. Which is what vampires do. Yeah. So vampires, they squirt on Maseratis. This is the, what they don't tell you. But I know it because I became a vampire and that's what I did. Um, and then I also recently squirted on a 1957 Thunderbird. Yeah. Can I ask you, like, whose cars these were and, like, how did this come about? Were they rented for the shoot? I'm pretty sure that one belonged to a director. Okay, so the he... Maserati. Okay, great. So he knew that was happening. Yeah, well, he, like, you know, when you fuck on a car, it's, like, mostly the outside of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, that was okay. Yeah. Right. The second... The vi the vintage classic car was a rental. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of just, like, try not to squirt in the interior. But, like, you know, you can... Outside, mostly. Mm -hmm. You said also that you would like to discuss men's buttholes. Oh, what, I just really what do love you have them. to say about men's buttholes? <laughs> well, I do love men's buttholes. I feel like there's just such a a stigma around men wanting their buttholes like attended to, mm -hmm. um, and I just think that we need to get rid of that. I think we all have orifices and holes and like there's it doesn't mean anything if you enjoy something in your butt mm -hmm. that's just my little psa from for straight guys yeah i mean there is a lot of pleasure to be had down there and i you're right there are a lot of men that are afraid of that i think first of all probably from a cleanliness angle right like they may not be as careful as women sometimes are mm -hmm. Not every man shaves down there. Um, but yeah, also like this huge fear that a lot of hetero men have of like being like. I think that they're afraid gay. to enjoy it. Yeah. Because, because that could mean. It, they think it's like a can of worms. And if you like keep the butthole on lock. Yeah. Like keep it like ignore it. Then you'll never have a gay feeling in your life. It's like, like, the, it's like the gateway drug, right? Exactly. Like the rimming is the gateway drug to oh, yeah. like. Then it's being, a finger, then it's a dildo, then it's another dick, and then... Then you're it. getting a double anal on Fire Island, and you have <laughs> poppers in your nose. It's like we went from rimming to, like, mesh tank tops. <laughs> just, just like that. <laughs> That's what happens. I mean, what would you say to... I mean, as somebody who grew up around so much gay culture, what would you say to the typical... A, you know, average male guy who is like terrified of enjoying any kind of anal play or being associated with like any kind of homosexuality tendencies? Well, I would say that like you, I know it feels hard in this world we live in to not be preoccupied with labels, but like just be yourself and whatever you do doesn't define you. If you like things in your butt, you can still be a straight guy, um, and you have a G, you have a G spot in there. So like, don't be afraid of pleasure. Don't be afraid of things just because you are gonna label yourself or stigmatize yourself because of it. Because ultimately, this is something that we're doing. Most people are doing in private, mm -hmm. and it's like enjoy, explore. Like, don't be afraid to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you have also been the only girl in a gay orgy. How did you find yourself <laughs> in that position? And how was it? Oh, my God. Um, so I love Fire Island. A lot of people probably don't know what that is, but it's like Fire Island is a gay beach village off of New York. It's kind of like the gay version of the Hamptons. Um, but I was going like every summer and I went with a bunch of my friends and it was basically just like I was the only girl and it was like all my gay guy friends and we were just like going out every night and kind of the only thing to do there is like they'll have parties there's like one or two bars mm -hmm. and they'll have parties but like you kind of just show up to people's houses and there's always like some kind of orgy going on mm -hmm. um so yeah I, I had a huge crush on my two friends who were a couple and like we had been like on Molly making out all week and mm -hmm. it kind of just like escalated basically 
we showed up to this house thinking there was a party and it was like these two guys like watching TV and they were like, but no, come on in. And we were like 10 people. <laughs> and then we were all downstairs naked in the pool at some point and then i noticed everyone disappearing uh-huh. and then i asked my friend i was like where did everyone go he's like they're upstairs sucking dick and i was just like oh i, and then I was like dick. i, I want to suck some dick so i i didn't get action from more than a my two friends mm-hmm. but like i was it was a room full of gay guys fucking mm-hmm. and i yeah, I had sex with my two gay friends. Did you walk in and did did you did anybody give like a like what 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 is she doing here? Not or did you really. just like I like I feel like I maybe the guys that don't know me but I, my my friends just like are, kind of are like you're a gay guy. Yeah. Um so they no they didn't think anything of it and I just kind of walked up to my two friends who were like playing with this one guy on the couch and I was like can I join? I was like really like timidly like wanted to join and they were like yes and then I ended up being one of my friend's first pussies. I was like I took his I stole his gold star. I was just gonna <laughs> ask you if you like were someone's like first woman yeah, that they he were was with. Like, he was like fascinated by how a pussy felt after that. He was like it's like alive. It like moves. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that like maybe you converted him? You might want to have yeah, I feel with like him? I feel like uh the other one like had like considered himself by but the one who's whose gold star I snatched I feel like he feels like more fluid now. Mm-hmm. And I feel like a lot of people I know whether like you identify culturally as gay or not but like I feel like I feel like everyone's becoming more fluid just across the board. Yeah. Yeah. I think that as like the societal restrictions kind of loosen their hold in some, in some cases, in they other cases, their hole. hole. <laughs> <laughs> they say any hole is a goal, and I really, <laughs> I really believe in that. <laughs> How have I never heard that before? Any hole is a goal. I don't That's know. Really clever. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, so it sounds like, you know, you've, so you're also a Pornhub brand ambassador, right? Yes, I am. Were you surprised? When did they ask you to do that? And like, were you surprised by it? I was, I didn't, I honestly didn't even know that that was a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I was surprised and honored that they like wanted me to do that because there's not very many of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's there. you, Asa, Kira, Natasha Dreams. And now Ricky Johnson. And Ricky Johnson. I know Kira Noir was, but I think now Kira she just, no- Noir yeah, she was. Still is. She still is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't know if like you could be a browser's contract girl and a born up ambassador. I guess you can. I think you can because it's under you, the same little I mean, yeah, I just I didn't know almost. like if she got like her browser's contract and they were like I don't know. She's I just still a born hub girl. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good to know. Mm-hmm. I guess I could have asked her that two weeks ago <laughs> when she was in here, but you know. Um, yeah, I just, I, so basically it was through Andrew Richardson, who has Richardson Magazine. Like, Oh, I know he, him. Yeah, he works, he works a lot with Pornhub and I had been modeling for him mm-hmm. and he told me, he's like, come to this Pornhub event in New York. And I was like, only like if I get like flown out and he's like Pornhub is gonna like fly you out and like pay you to be Pornhub and amb- like do an ambassador duty of like you know wearing a Pornhub thing and doing social media stuff and so I was like hell yeah I get to this party and I kid you not it's like all of my f- actual friends in New York all these people I've met throughout the years and I was like this is work I was like shut up I got to be in New York and be with my friends no way and so I just, I kind of had a ball. And then after that, they were like, I guess they liked that I knew people mm-hmm. <laughs> or I don't know, or like just that my vibe fit with theirs. Mm-hmm. And then they asked me to be an ambassador. That's really cool. Yeah. They're a good company to work for. They are. They're great. Yeah. I'm su- And I, I really like um, the way that Pornhub like handles its position, like in culture. Mm-hmm. I feel like they... Pornhub considers what we do an adult as like an- just another facet of culture and they like are always intermixing it with fashion, music, nightlife in this really interesting way. Um and and I'm really proud to be a part of it. Yeah, there's definitely like a level of advocacy there and like you said, 
you know, kind of culturalism that a lot of other brands, really kind of no other brands are really doing. Mm -hmm. So I know, I do, I love that about them too. Um, well, Queenie, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure to get to know you. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you for my Patreon members that we'll do in a special Q&A segment just for those who are a member of my Patreon. Of course, you can be one of those as well if you go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Um, in the meantime, Queenie, can you let everybody know where they can find you online? Yes. Thank you for having me, by the way. You can find me on Instagram at Miss Queenie XO. Twitter, Queenie Satine, and my TikTok is Miss Queenie XOX. Awesome. And then you guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Holly Randall. Go to hollylinks.com for links to all of my social media profiles. I'm pretty much on everything, um, but there's way too many to list. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next week. <laughs>